Good afternoon and uh, welcome back to the online seminar series Machine Learning Needs Mathematical Optimization. Today we have the great pleasure of uh, having uh, uh, Professor Bielsa, Concha Bielsa from uh, the Polytechnic University of Madrid. She's a full professor of statistics and operations research at the Department of Artificial Intelligence there. Um, her primary research interests are uh, probabilistic graphical models, decision analysis, meta heuristics for optimization, um, data money and classification models. Her work is inspired by real world applications in biomedicine, bioinformatics, neuroscience, industry 4.4 and sports. She has published uh, uh, more than 150 papers, has written uh, uh, more than six books, and has served in um, editorial boards as well as gets editor uh, for special issues. She has also been very successful in her fundraising activities with more than uh, 50 uh, public research projects and more than 25 private ones and has received uh, personal awards for her research, including um, the uh, UPM uh, Research Prize and the Amity University Machine Learning Award in 2020. So thank you very much, Concha, for accepting to uh, be today at the online seminar series. You have attracted uh, a big audience today. And uh, now the floor is yours. And for the audience, um, we will um, address the questions uh, at the very end um, in the, in the Q&A uh, session. Thank you so much again. OK. Hi, everyone. Um, and thank you for the, for the introduction, Dolores. And thank you for inviting me for, to be part of this uh, very interesting uh, seminar series. So my, the title of my talk is uh, Modeling Multivariate Time Series with Bayesian Networks. So we'll introduce uh, very briefly what is a Bayesian network, and then um, I will deal with some um, variations of, base, of the standard Bayesian networks uh, for dynamic domains, dynamic Bayesian networks, hidden Markov models, and then in continuous time, Bayesian networks. So let me start by with the introduction, temporal data. Uh, so we, we have this kind of uh, setting where we have a system state X, uh, including many variables. This is a vector. And this is evolving over time. When we uh, fix uh, time T, we have a snapshot of uh, the relevant attributes that may be hidden or observed. And we would like to represent the joint distribution over um, the data that we have that are trajectories, assignments to each uh, XIT, uh, XI is the variable, and T time. So we have uh, this kind of data um, occurring at different bases. For instance, uh, we would like to be uh, interested in the specific time of occurrence of an event, like an accident, or perhaps from time to time, uh, we have a, a patient follow up, or we perhaps have a sequence uh, in a, the typical manufacturing process with an end, or the time series as uh, weather or data stream, the streams, in, for instance, in, in finance and, well, in finance and all these data uh, arise in different application areas, as you can see here. And um, the data are collected uh, from different sources, uh, maybe manually or with uh, a specific device like in medicine or perhaps more continuously as in, uh, data coming from sensors or wearables. So this is more or less the tasks uh, that we have in machine learning, clustering, uh, regression, feature selection, association discovery, anomaly detection, supervised classification, and this version multidimensional. And in each box, we, we see different techniques. But uh, as you can see, in all of them, we, we see Bayesian networks. And this gives an idea of how flexible, uh, how flexible they are. So let me uh, very briefly um, review what is a Bayesian network. This is a probabilistic graphical model that contains uh, first uh, a graph, directed acyclic graph. 
that is very useful for the interpretation. Uh, here we have, for instance, uh, that neuronal atrophy and stroke depend on age, and um, both uh, have an influence on dementia, and then we have also this adult relationship, probabilistic relationship. So the second part is uh, the, the parameters, the conditional probability tables, including these uh, probabilities, uh, local distributions for, for each node given its parents in the graph. So uh, we have this factorization of all of them, giving rise to the joint distribution of all variables, where we are using uh, the most important concept uh, underlying Bayesian networks, which is the conditional independence between triplets of variables. So in this example, we have this factorization of the five variables according to the graph. And with the Bayesian network, we, we can perform any kind of uh, probabilistic uh, reasoning or uh, statistical inference with exact or approximate uh, algorithms. For instance, here we have uh, an evidence that we have had um, a stroke. Uh, we have a patient with a, with a stroke. And then we would like this information to be propagated through the network for the rest of the variables to compute the probability of each variable given that we have this information. So this is the kind of inference that we can uh, perform. And this is an example taken from Bielsa Laranaga 2020, which is this book uh, published by Cambridge University Press, uh, where we uh, deal with uh, all machine learning and statistical models uh, applied to this uh, field of neuroscience where we have been working in the last years. As you can see, it's a very thick book. And well, this is my recommendation for all of you. We learned the Bayesian networks from data. Uh, so this uh, this is um, this means that we have to, to learn two elements, the parameters, these local distributions of each uh, XI variable given its parents, can be done with a maximum likelihood estimation or a Bayesian approach. And also we have to learn the structure. Um, for this, we have two main approaches, the constraint-based approach, which is basically um, performing different conditional independent tests. And then um, when we have uh, when we have the list of results, we have to, to draw the structure that matches uh, as much as possible uh, this list. Or alternatively, we can use a score that is measuring how good is my structure. And then we will move uh, in the space of, uh, of structures to, to, to have a better scoring structure. So here are different search spaces, uh, different score and different uh, ways uh, to search. Uh, as regards the scores, let me tell you that, uh, well, it's important not to use the likelihood because it will tend to, to, to give rise to complete structures. Uh, so we have to penalize the likelihood. Uh, and if we follow a Bayesian approach, uh, then we are going to maximize the posterior distribution of the structures within the data, with, with, um, which in turn, well, this posterior is decomposed as the marginal likelihood here and the prior with the structures. This marginal likelihood, which is the, the most important uh, term, because sometimes the prior is uh, uniform, so this is at the end the, the most important issue. As you can see, is uh, the integral of the likelihood uh, weighted with the, the, the prior over the parameters, theta, these uh, probabilities. So here we basically use the Dirichlet distribution uh, because it's conjugate uh, uh, with respect to the polynomial, I mean the multinomial, sorry. Um, so the issue here is that this uh, marginal likelihood is uh, smoother than what we have here because we are weighting uh, the, the, the likelihood uh, with the prior parameters, with the prior of the parameters, uh, rather than here where we uh, just plug in the maximum likelihood estimations in the likelihood. So as, as I said, uh, we can use uh, this uh, uh, Bayesian networks for supervised classification. In this case, we have a class variable. On um, this joint distribution that we have to maximize uh, is factorized according to different structures where we allow more and more dependencies between the, the predictor variables and even for the class. Um, 
we also uh, can be extend the, the problem to more than one class variable, uh, assuming that they are related, because this is the interesting part. Um, so here we introduce uh, this uh, specific architecture where we allow the classes to be related uh, uh, from classes to features, and also uh, features uh, can be related. So I will uh, come back to these kind of models later. So let's start with the first uh, kind of models, dynamic Bayesian networks, where we uh, basically discretize the timeline into a set of time slices that are regularly spaced. So we have some predetermined granularity that we call delta. Uh, we basically uh, are observing the value of each variable uh, at uh, different times uh, that are regularly spaced. T0, T0 plus delta, T0 plus 2 delta, and so on, up the, until um, we reach the, the, the last uh, horizon. So we, we allow for the arcs uh, to have uh, arcs forward in time, uh, as, uh, in, this, in this case, uh, and arcs also within a time slice. Um, so at the end, what we have is uh, to model this uh, joint distribution for all variables and all time steps from 0 to t, um, which is decomposed as the initial distribution and the product of all these transition networks of uh, hxt given the past. Sometimes these uh, probabilities are uh, assumed to be uh, simpler. So if we have a Markovian order 1, for instance, this, this means that we to predict xt, we only need the, the past, the, the last, uh, the very last uh, uh, previous step. So um, to, to model this uh, joint distribution, we have to, um, to convert uh, these transition networks that are always uh, equal. Uh, we have to copy this, uh, this uh, template many times uh, together with this initial distribution, which is itself uh, another Bayesian network, to have the unroll Bayesian network uh, that represents this joint distribution. And as you can see, we have uh, stationarity because the uh, both the structure and the, and the parameters uh, don't depend on t. So uh, as you can imagine, the granularity is very important uh, because perhaps, uh, well, if we are forced to, to fix this uh, granularity, then we are not going to manage different levels of time granularity. So for instance, imagine that we have this discrete variable x1 and this uh, continuous variable x2, and we, we choose a very coarse um, and granularity. So in this case, we are going to lose here for X2 many events over the period. And conversely, if we use a very, very fine uh, granularity as uh, here, well, we are going to, to have for X1 uh, no, uh, no activity for a long time, and then it's going to be very computationally demanding. So it's uh, difficult uh, to, to find a trade-off uh, for these two situations. And it's a very important issue. For inferences, we have uh, much flexibility because once we have uh, some evidence and we are at t, then we can ask about uh, variables uh, at t uh, or variables after some time prediction or variables in the previous times. This is a smooth thing that we where we try to to improve the predictions now that we have more evidence. So this is uh, an example where we are asking about this. Uh, a variable at t plus one, once we have uh, information about these others, so this is a, a prediction and this is smoothing. In principle, uh, we can think of applying uh, any inference algorithm that we have for Bayesian networks, but uh, you can imagine that we have a very big Bayesian network here uh, because of this uh, horizon. Um, so this means that we are going to, to keep uh, a very large history of observations and the, the algorithms are going to be very costly. For the learning of these structures, we have to learn the, the initial Bayesian network, which is not uh, considering the temporal information. So we have uh, just to take the data and consider the data as if uh, we don't have any temporal um, issue. So we have here, for instance, instance one with x1, x2, and x3 at different times. And instance number two, so this just taking this uh, a matter of taking this data and learn the, the structure for the transition network. Since this is talking about how um, how uh, 
how the, the, the states are changing. If we are going to assume, for instance, a Markovian order one, then we are going to look at these uh, changes from two to three, three to two, two to one, and so on. So we have to transform the data set into something like this, and then learn the transition network from this uh, data set. So this is an example of quenching with a laser. So in this case, uh, we have to um, a laser beam that is going to induce um, a very, uh, well, very, very fast uh, cooling uh, and heating cycles over some piece of, uh, in this case, steel to, to, to have uh, good properties, uh, the piece. Um, well, in this case, the piece is a crankshaft, which is uh, in our cars, as, as you can say, as, as you can know. Um, well, the process is uh, being recorded by this uh, thermal camera, where we, we see these uh, kind of images, uh, 32 by 32 pixels with the temperatures. And since the laser spot is, is very uh, small compared to the width of the, of the piece, uh, the laser spot has to, to, to move very, very fast to cover uh, the whole width of the piece. So finally, we, we have this kind of of um, input data, uh, this kind of videos uh, taken from the thermal camera at the very, very well, one uh, 100 frames per, per second is the, the speed of the camera. So the uh, dynamic Bayesian networks, first um, we uh, try to summarize the, the images uh, by looking for regions of similar behavior. Uh, this was done with the clustering. And then from each of them, we record or we, yeah, we measure different statistics like the maximum, the minimum, the median, or the, and the standard deviation. And then we look at the, these are the nodes of the Bayesian network, of the dynamic Bayesian network for each of the regions. So then we can uh, inspect uh, the structure that we have obtained. For instance, here for this region in yellow, we have uh, the points in the same time slice here or here, uh, parents uh, from the previous time slice. So according to this uh, interpretation, uh, and also by looking at the conditional probability tables, we finally could uh, model the, the, um, how the, the laser spot moves. And in fact, we use this for, for anomaly detection. So this uh, example is, uh, you can find it here in, in this other book that we, uh, published uh, two years ago in, in CRC about industrial applications of machine learning. Another um, example in industry has to do with uh, fouling in industrial furnaces. So we have here the oil between the furnace uh, must be preheated. And so the problem is that um, this is to be chemica chemically reactive, uh, but some impurities are deposited, some oil is solidified and then it forces uh, to clean the tubes periodically by the operators to uh, remove uh, this falling layer because it acts as an insulation and this means that uh, we have to apply much and much energy to uh, reach uh, the desired temperature and this is very inefficient and also we uh, well we have to to take care of not uh, melting the tube walls of course uh, so the temperature is, is an important issue, and this is what we would like to predict, the, uh, the temperature to be provided to the walls as the fall in the balls, because uh, uh, the higher the temperature, the thicker the falling layer is. Uh, but we are interested in the, in the long term, that means uh, 2,000 hours, more than two months and a half. Uh, so this is the kind of data that we have. These are our trajectories uh, for, for the temperature that uh, is coming in cycles because once we clean the tubes, we, we, we go back to the st starting, um, well, everything is, is restored. Um, so by predicting the temperature, we will help the operators uh, to decide when the next cleaning should be um, uh, should, should take place. And we have uh, lots of data of five years and hourly data of uh, 35 variables uh, taken from sensors uh, about uh, physical properties like uh, pressure, temperatures, feed flow, heaters, and so on. 
So this is uh, the results uh, typically are going to be like this with uh, very good results uh, in the long term, which uh, this was our, our aim. As you can see here in the long term, the, the error. Um, well, in this case, we are using dynamic Gaussian Bayesian networks because we have uh, continuous variables. Uh, we try with different Markovian orders from one to seven. And at the end, the best was uh, order four. So this means that uh, for the temperature that we are predicting, uh, we need the, the previous four uh, time slices. Um, this is very good because we are, remember that we are um, predicting uh, two hours, 2,000 hours ahead. We have implemented uh, all these uh, ideas with a visualization tool as well, uh, which is called the DBNR package uh, in R. Um, we can simulate uh, scenarios uh, to see the effect of some uh, variable that we can change, uh, how this uh, has an, an effect on the target. Uh, we also compare uh, models against, uh, against other well, artificial neural networks and so on in this, in this paper that we have uh, recently published. So the second uh, models are hidden Markov models that in fact are, are in a particular case of uh, dynamic Bayesian networks. So we have a double chain stochastic model. We have this kind of uh, Bayesian network where we have uh, the observed chain here in red, um, a hidden chain uh, where we have some hypotheses, for instance, uh, that the, the transitions for, for, the, for the hidden process, uh, these uh, probabilities of Q given the rest of the Qs uh, follow uh, half, they have uh, this first of the Markovian property. So this is why we are representing the Bayesian network as this. Um, we have to determine this or estimate this uh, transitions, AIJ, the probabilities of uh, uh, transitioning from I to J for the hidden part. And also for the observable process, we have that uh, and they depend, these uh, variables depend on, on the hidden process this way. So we only need uh, to, to know this, uh, this Q for, for the probability of XT, which is given by this VIXT, which is called the emission probabilities. Uh, so this is the probability of X uh, given that uh, Q was uh, I. This is the I here. And we also need the initial uh, distribution to start with the process. So rather than working with this uh, simple or well standard HMMs, we uh, in this paper we have uh, proposed uh, two two extensions. The first one is that uh, we are going to generalize the emission uh, distributions VI to be linear Gaussian Bayesian networks. So um, the idea is that we are not going to have here the joint distribution, but we are going to explicitly have uh, a linear Gaussian Bayesian network. Uh, so for VI we have the product of uh, probabilities of each x i given its points, and the points can be different for each uh, value for the state. This is why we, we find here the i. And they are a Gaussian, linear Gaussian. Linear means that we have uh, for the mean, um, it's encoded as a linear combination of the points. So this way we, we avoid the complete dependence of all the, the variables here. Uh, to better handle the, the, the high number of parameters that we, that we would have here and uh, trying not to overfit uh, the data. And the second uh, issue is uh, that we also allow uh, the autoregressive uh, terms. Um, so this means that the BI um, are like this, uh, condition on some previous uh, past of the same variables. So we have here the probability of x uh, k given some other case, x case uh, in the past, uh, and each one uh, has a, a different p i k. Uh, so this depends on i, uh, which is the state of uh, the hidden state, the the, the q, and k, which is the, the variable. So uh, this means that we are going to add some other um, linear combination here in the mean for these uh, variables. So at the end, what we are going to have is this uh, kind of network where we, for instance, you can see here that for Q equal one, we have a Bayesian network here, linear Gaussian Bayesian network, where for instance, um, 
X2 depends on two previous steps here, so we have an autoregressive order uh, of two, uh, whereas X1 only depends on, on the previous, so we have a one. Uh, when Q equal two, uh, then we have a different Bayesian network. So this is uh, very flexible. Um, so we had to, to adapt the typical questions of how to compute the likelihood or how to compute the maximum uh, of well, the, the configuration of states that is most likely given the, the observations um, or how to estimate the parameters. So the typical three uh, fundamental problems in HMMs, we had to adapt to our setting. Uh, so we define the likelihood, we have uh, more parameters uh, so we have seen and um, we had to adapt these uh, three algorithms to our case and, and we had to define the param how to estimate the parameters and the structure and how to find this PIK for the autoregressive orders. So this is in, in this paper. Uh, let me show you some uh, very more or less uh, easy example that is um, related to ball bearing degradation. So ball bearings are uh, critical components inside any rotating machine. So it's very interesting to monitor uh, the failure, the degradation, because this uh, causes uh, wasting money, time and assets for industries. So we took the data set from this paper, which um, we see where we see the, the setup, we have a rotor motor that is spinning at uh, 2000 RPM, coupled with four bearings, and here we have some forces. So uh, we have some sensors in the, in the system, and this uh, about uh, vibrations that uh, produces a signal, uh, many signals that are filtered, and then we apply the Fourier transform to work in the, in the frequency domain, and at the end we work with uh, the four fundamental frequencies that are related to the, the bearing defects in, in the four components of the bearing, which are the inner ra ra uh, race here, the outer race here, the cage and the balls. So these are the observed variables, these four, and then we have, uh, well, because uh, this is very well known that uh, if these frequencies have a high magnitude, then uh, this is associated to an abnormal behavior. And our hidden state is the, the bearing health state. So uh, we're, well, once we, we build a, an HMM for each uh, bearing, for instance, for, B, for B3, we compare um, our model uh, against other models. Um, and as you can imagine, the typical output is to, to, see, to look at the Viterbi path, which is uh, showing us what are the, the most likely uh, states uh, given that we have some observations but here we uh, decided to to define a, a function that transforms the states into numbers that are trying to explain what is whether the, there has been a change or not and of course also um, their magnitude so this is important it's a kind of automatic numerical labeling um, and in this case, since we have seen that uh, the high magnitude frequency is associated to the abnormal behavior, then this is why we define G to be the sum of the mean magnitudes of all variables. So here we see that uh, at the end we, we are having um, a very high uh, G, the meaning that we have um, a degradation of the, of the bearing. Um, as you can see, the other models well, this is the, the real uh, behavior in the outer race. Uh, that was uh, the one that uh, was failing. Um, so the, the rest of the models uh, give inconsistent outputs or noisy results, and perhaps this uh, could be uh, good, but this is not so good. Uh, the profile is similar to ours, but uh, you can see here that the magnitudes are this in the scale that the magnitudes uh, are significant have uh, significant differences so this is our model and then we could uh, check that uh, it's a good model in terms of um, fitting according to some some scores and also with a reasonable amount of parameters and also interesting is to to look at the basic networks that we have um, defined depending on on the 
on the hidden state. For, insta for instance, here we have the patient network given a healthy bearing, and here um, a not healthy bearing. In here we can see that the, the cage fix uh, determines the remaining variables. Uh, here we have more complex relationships, even dependencies of uh, past uh, variables. So this is uh, an information that is very useful for, for the experts. So last um, kind of models is um, continuous time Bayesian networks. So in this case, uh, our data set, because we work in continuous time, are going to be uh, this um, kind of, uh, well, these sequences that are fully observed trajectories uh, where we have a complete set of uh, transitions here with the colors and the times at which uh, they occur. So we have, for instance, these two variables and the first variable is uh, changing like this at these times and the other variable is changing as, as this. So this is the first sequence, and then we have a second sequence, and so on. So this is my data set. So some theoretical framework about uh, what is a finite state homogeneous Markov process, where we have a random variable, which is discrete and is evolving in continuous time. So this is defined by, by a matrix of transition intensities. So in this case, uh, the Q with a double index uh, means the intensity of transitioning from one state to other state. And in the diagonal, we have these Qs with only one index, uh, which is the sum of the rest of the row. So it's row sum to zero. And this QI is the parameter of the exponential distribution that is uh, modeling the time spent uh, at, at, the, at the state. So um, we can derive uh, what is the expected time of living state, which is 1 over QI for this, uh, because this is exponential, and also the probability of transitioning from I to J, which is given by this quotient. So we we have here the when and the where. So, but in, in a Bayesian network, we don't have uh, only one variable, but many. So with many variables, uh, we, we are going to, uh, to say that uh, the evolution of uh, each of them depends on the state of its parents in the graph. So the, mean, the meaning of the arcs are instantaneous influence because we have continuous time and because we have in continuous time, two variables cannot transition at the same instant. So um, to have uh, the, the structure uh, and the parameters, uh, then we need an initial distribution, as always, specified as a Bayesian network, as in DBNs. But the most interesting uh, part is the, the um, continuous time transition model. So here we have a, a graph that uh, perhaps uh, contains cycles, uh, which is directed. And then mm, we have uh, this uh, kind of matrices we saw here but for each variable and for each instantiation of the parts. So we have a conditional intensity matrix. So inside this uh, matrix, we have the rate, uh, the rate of living state, uh, given that the parts uh, were at this uh, value, and also the, the probability of transitioning. So uh, each XK conditional uh, on its uh, parents um, behave as um, behaves as, as in an inhomogeneous Markov process because the intensities are varying with time, not as a function of time per se, but uh, as, uh, as, um, as um, a function of, of the, how the other variables are changing because they are evolving also as, as Markov processes. So uh, let me show you a, an example taken from Nodelman. In his thesis, uh, he defines this track network. This is a partial view where we see the cycle. So in this case, we have a person who is uh, hungry, yes or no. This depends on how full is his stomach. And this depends on, on whether he's not eating. Uh, he depend, this depends on whether he's hungry or not. So, so we have this kind of cycles. And, and we need these uh, matrices uh, depending on, on the instantiation of the parents. For instance, here we have that the person is eating. So we have equal yes. And then we are going to, to build a three by three matrix uh, for, for S, for, for the stomach. Um, and could be like this. So for instance, we expect that if, we, if he has a stomach empty, 
uh, then he will stop having an empty stomach to, to move to other state in one over six uh, hours or 10 minutes. And also, if we look if we look at this number, this means that uh, S transitions from empty to full, um, the probability is one over six or five over six uh, from empty to average. Um, <clears throat> so uh, as you can see, we um, are not going to, re uh, to need any time granularity and we are explicitly representing the temporal dynamics, uh, which is uh, very different from dynamic Bayesian network. Um, an interesting uh, thing is uh, to see the CTBN as a single process over the joint state space. Uh, so it's a matter of um, building like a big queue with um, the, the, joint state, uh, the joint states here with two variables. So we have uh, these four uh, joint states with all the possibilities. So from these um, local matrices, we build this big matrix that uh, can be used uh, then for, for inference, for, uh, as we will see in, in a while. So here, for instance, in this anti diagonal, we are going to have zeros because we are moving from A0, B0 to A1, B1. So this is not possible because two variables cannot change at the same time. So here we have a four because we are moving from A0 to A1. B0 is, is constant, and this is given here from A0 to A1. Um, so this is the intensity. And also, for instance, this eight is from A1. Uh, A1 is fixed, and we are moving from B1 to B0, but A1 is fixed. So we have to look at this uh, number here. and. So this is a matter of just looking up in the corresponding matrices to, to have this big cube representing the, the joint, uh, well, the single process. Um, so uh, this is uh, our data set. So for inference, we can have uh, some information at a given instant, or we can have information about some interval where we see, where we know that uh, there are no changes or there are one change, this kind of uh, evidences. Uh, are very very interesting, but uh, perhaps more more interesting is the when we have a sequence of observations at different times uh, for different variables, and then um, we can propagate uh, the distribution over the values from uh, observation to observations, uh, although they are uh, irregularly spaced. So with um, the whole drug uh, network, um, let me show you an example where. Well, this is a network uh, where um, you can uh, take uh, some drug for alleviate some joint pain. So in this case, we have uh, this uh, sequence of observations. Uh, he took the drug and then after one hour and a half, he ate and then he felt drowsy after this time. And then what is the distribution of the pain six hours after taking the drug? So we have this kind of um, expression where we are using the initial distribution uh, to compute the distribution at time t with this um, um, uh, matrix, matrix exponential with this big Q and t. So we will use this and so we will first uh, compute the, the joint distribution at the first uh, observation time here with the formula and then we will uh, condition on the observation because he ate and then this new distribution will be used as the initial distribution, this one, for the next uh, observation um, time, the second one. So this V is uh, lagging here, and then we we move uh, to this, uh, this time to 0.6 to have the, the new distribution. And then we continue with the same idea uh, until uh, reaching time six, uh, where we have the distribution, the joint distribution. And then we can marginalize on J to, to have uh, only the information, the distribution uh, over the pain. So this is very interesting. Uh, for learning this kind of structures, we first have to define the likelihood. Uh, so for, if we only have one variable, imagine that uh, we have a transition from this uh, state to this other state after spending time A in this state. So for this transition, the likelihood is uh, computed as uh, given by the, the density function of the exponential uh, regarding the time spent and then the probability of transitioning to, to, the, to the new state. 
So for, a, for one variable, uh, we will see um, movements or transitions like this. And we, then we have to multiply all the likelihoods of all the transitions. And as you can see here, um, you, we have uh, twice this uh, theta to three because we have uh, moved here from two to three and here from two to three. So this will be to the to the square. Um, also for the times that we spent uh, at uh, this state, sorry, at this state is this uh, this time a one and this is a three. So this plus this will go to the exponential part to compute the, the time that we spend at uh, state num number two. And then we have for the, for the queues, uh, we have two queues because we are leaving this state twice here and here. So at the end, what we have, uh, not only with one variable, but with all of them, we have to join all of them in the likelihood function, all the variables, all the, the states, the instantiations of the parents and all the, the states for the variables. And the queues are, um, have this uh, power uh, uh, to the number of transitions leaving, leaving the states, as I mentioned here, for the queues and uh, the times uh, spent at each uh, state uh, are in the exponential. And then we have for the thetas, the number of transitions from one state to other state. So these are the sufficient statistics that we have to compute to have the likelihood. And then from here, we can derive the likelihood and obtain the maximum likelihood estimations for the Qs and the thetas. And also in, from a Bayesian point of view, we can do the same by assuming some priors or for the Qs, uh, gammas, which is conjugate uh, for the exponential and Dirichlet for thetas, which are conjugate for the with respect to the multinomial. So we have other expressions. So we have now the parameters for the structure. Typically, we use a Bayesian score. We have the, the marginal likelihood here and the prior distribution over the structure that is um, a good score because it is decomposable as a sum of family scores. This means that we are going to have um, um, sums over families. This means uh, a variable and its parents. So this is going to, to make easier how to, um, to maximize this, this score. The search, in fact, is easier than in other Bayesian networks because we only have arcs across time. We are allowed to have cycles, and then we can optimize the balance set of each uh, XK independently. So this is not so hard to, 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 to maximize this score. So one example here in industry is uh, to detect anomalies in, in network traffic data, which is an ongoing uh, project uh, nowadays. So here we have a very, a very regular um, sequence and timing of events because uh, typically we are going to have not activity for a, for a long time and then suddenly or come in a quick burst, for instance. Uh, so it's going to be very difficult to model this with uh, dynamic Bayesian networks. So um, the typical approach is uh, to model normality. And then if we receive uh, some activity uh, that is uh, differing from according to the normality, then we will signal it as, as, um, as a possible attack. So in, the, in our case, we, we had the data from port scan attacks where an attacker uh, has to or tries to discover open ports to infiltrate. Uh, this is about communication between industrial devices. Uh, nowadays in Industry 4.0, we have uh, all devices uh, connected. So this is very important. We had uh, 14 hours uh, of simulated data uh, under normality and we use the typical variables in these um, settings, uh, IP source and destination, internet protocol, port ID, and some TCP flags that are very, very um, useful. We prepare the trajectories of this data with sliding windows of uh, 1,000 records. And apart from, from having some information from the CTBN, from the structure, uh, we obtain a very stable log likelihood for, under the normal behavior. So once uh, we had this uh, characterization of the normality, then we received some unseen data set with anomalies. And we saw first that uh, the likelihood uh, 
was very, very in magnitude, very different from normality. Um, and then we uh, try to identify different uh, cases here uh, with a change point detection algorithm. Um, so we could uh, zoom in in each part, uh, like here, this is case number two. And by looking at the, we try to interpret each, each of the cases, uh, uh, identifying the symptoms. Uh, the symptoms for us mean the, the variables that are responsible, well, the variables, not the, the sufficient statistics, these M's and T's that are responsible of, of this uh, add uh, value for the, lack, for the log likelihood. Um, so in this case, uh, for instance, we, we could uh, label this attack as a TCP fin scan, which is uh, just a label that you can find in, in a reference guide uh, used in this context. Um, that means that there are many packet, packets sent by the attacker to many ports uh, of the victim. And the victim is replying with other flies, uh, flags, uh, sorry, because uh, the attacker is trying to access ports that are closed. So something that we derive by looking at the, this, um, this uh, M's here, this uh, sufficient statistics. So now um, we will um, look at uh, supervised classification with only one class. Uh, so the sequence uh, end uh, with a label. For instance, uh, we have uh, movement in post hoc rehabilitation exercises, and then we are um, uh, giving the correctness, yes or no, of the of the movement. So this uh, trajectory is uh, giving rise to some labels. Is uh, my data set uh, from now on? Uh, for this, in the literature, we have um, only to to add the, the class variable, uh, which is not uh, so hard because it doesn't depend on time. So this is static. Um, there are typical structures uh, found in, in any for any well, for static uh, classifiers like base, tan, or those that allow a maximum number of, of parents. Uh, here we have two for the predictor variables uh, to make uh, the learning uh, easier. And uh, we are going to learn the structures with different scores at different search uh, strategies. So this is found in, in the literature and. And what is important is to um, to to compute this probability of uh, of the class given a sequence which is unseen, because this is, has to be maximized to find the the C star that maximizes this. Um, so this is the predicted level, and this can be decomposed as given by this expression, where we uh, have again um, intervals where there are no changes, and at the end of an interval, we have a change of only one variable. So this is uh, um, captured here, uh, where we are computing the probability of being at, at, um, at a state, moving to other state uh, is, uh, in fact, movement of only one variable. And it's given by the, the exponential um, distribution. And here, also, for staying during a, a while, uh, this interval is given by the exponential. So. Um, it's not so hard to, to use this, uh, this kind of probabilities to compute the, the posterior probability of the class to have finally the classification. And in our case, we have, try, we have tried to um, uh, extend these ideas to multidimensional classification where we have many class variables that uh, perhaps are related. Um, so in this case, uh, we use our idea of multidimensional Bayesian network classifiers uh, uh, where we now allow, uh, well, for the classes, this is more or less the same. We have just a Bayesian network because it's, it is static, so we have to learn this Bayesian network. And then for the other part, we have a CTDN allowing cycles here. Um, we have defined some scores to learn these structures and how they are derived. And also how uh, we have this uh, probability that we mentioned before for one class, how this is extended to more than one class, that uh, we have some changes uh, here as described in this, in this paper. Uh, so the example here is uh, energy disaggregation. So this means that we are going to use uh, the aggregate power consumption to identify how each individual motor operates. 
so we have like a, a, a signal. So we have this kind of uh, industrial machine, um, which is, um, well, very complex because of the movements of the different motors. They are related and they are giving some uh, information uh, through the sensors. Um, and then we would like uh, to transform the, the consumption state, uh, the power consumption state of each motor into a class. So we have three, uh, three states, uh, six classes, which are motors here and here. Um, and we are going to use the, the energy consumption of the machine as a whole as measured by electrical variables of the whole um, consumption which is the intensity, the voltage, and different powers, the active, reactive, and apparent power, and that are discretized because these models work with, uh, with discrete variables. And we have also uh, three ABC per variable because they are three-phase motors. So we have a total of 15 variables. Um, since uh, because of this setting, we have some physical relationships. Uh, for instance, uh, motor one and motor two work together on similar tasks. Um, C3 comes later, and so on. So have some physical relations. Um, so in this case, um, we train sequences uh, with uh, only uh, 0.3 seconds uh, according to the needs of the company. So it's a very, very tiny uh, sequence here. This is the, uh, the active power uh, of the whole machine. Um, so we have uh, this number of observations uh, per sequence, and here we have the the different um, states for the different uh, machines, one up to six uh, in these three states that uh, are recorded with, with sensors. So finally, we obtain this CTBN, multi-CTBN C for classification with six classes, uh, only in the in these um, powers, uh, the apparent power and the active power were selected and we could uh, observe that uh, well the relationships uh, for the classes uh, are in accordance with the setup um, also the children of each of the classes uh, are the same because in fact they are similar motors and also we have this relationship for the different phases of um, of the of s and, and p the the active and and apparent uh, powers. And also, uh, of course, in accuracy, this uh, performed well, uh, better than uh, using six independent uh, classifiers uh, with only one class uh, per model. And we could also predict uh, for the different uh, motors uh, the, 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 here, the, the three states. So here we are over in impressing the, the three labels uh, over the active power for electric motor one, two, and three. And you can see that uh, one and two uh, are synchronously working. Um, three is, uh, has some, some delay here and here you can see. Um, so conclusions uh, have finished. Um, we have seen different models for dealing with dynamic processes and Bayesian networks. So we are uh, explicitly representing the dependencies and exploiting the independencies and they are interpretable. Uh, we have seen HMMs and DBNs for continuous and discrete states but discrete time and CTBNs for discrete time and continuous uh, time. Um, further topics are how to deal with missing data, performing feature selection, extend to semi-parametric Bayesian networks, not necessarily Gaussian, to use other distributions different from the exponential for the time duration, to mix a discrete and continuous time, uh, to, to model non-stationary works or time varying networks, and to include also decisions like in the Markov decision processes or in the partially observed Markov decision processes. And that's it. Uh, thank you very much to uh, the companies that uh, provided us with the data and the problem. And these are the main papers uh, that I have mentioned. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Concha, for um, the very interesting uh, overview of uh, 
Bayesian networks and um, also for the many industrial applications that you have shown to us uh, today. So this is very, uh, very uh, uh, great for us. Um, so we can open now uh, the floor for questions. Um, if you um, have any question, please raise your hand and we will give you uh, uh, the right to um, yeah, to use the microphone and the camera. I was curious about the feature selection. Um, um, so, uh, uh, what would be um, um, in this setting the techniques? I mean, in our case, obviously, we, we use some uh, zero one variables and then it turns out uh, a discrete problem, or we also use sometimes lasso. So, what would be the, 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 the approach in Bayesian networks? Hmm. In Bayesian networks, uh, well, you can use, uh, well, there are two big groups. One is uh, filter methods and other wrapper methods. This is in the field of supervised classification. I mean, uh, well, yeah. filter, uh, yeah, you, this is like a pre-screening because you are selecting features without having to, to learn the model. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. Just by instance, looking at the correlation or or the redundance of the variables, uh, you avoid it and, and you focus on the relevance of, of the variables with respect to the class. Uh, there are lots of methods there. And for the wrapper, you have to, to build the, the model. And then um, depending on how it behaves, for, for instance, according to the accuracy, then you move in the space of features to, to other um, well, with different algorithms, uh, genetic algorithms, or any uh, heuristic that you can imagine, you can move to other set of, uh, of, of features. And embedded methods are what you are mentioning, regularization, lasso, and so on, uh, has to do with uh, embedded methods where you um, at uh, simultaneously uh, you are learning and, and selecting the features like in the well in, in with the regularization in continuous domains we have a paper where we are selecting the features in for gaussian Bayesian networks with the lasso uh, mm -hmm. in streaming data or in, in temporal data is much more complex uh, because uh, it may be the case that one feature that is important now uh, perhaps tomorrow is not important, so you have to like to, to monitor this uh, this kind of uh, issues. Uh, so we have a review about this uh, feature selection in, in dynamic settings that have been published very recently, and um, and also we have uh, a paper, a very recent one for HMMs. For HMMs, we have defined like a relevance of of the variable, not a zero or one, yes or no, is in the model or not but um, like a, an important score, score that is changing, is included in these emission probabilities and is changing with, uh, with time. Yeah, thank you so much for your very thorough answer. So, uh, Carl, um, we can unmute you um, and you can uh, ask the question if you like. Uh, Christina. Oh, so, so uh, yeah, Carl says that he doesn't have a microphone. Okay, fine. I will ask the question. Um, if you have quantified the uncertainty of the predictor, oh, that's the question, whether you have uh, uh, quantified the uncertainty of the predictors, uh, Bayesian networks usually have a high computational cost compared to traditional time series models. Could you talk about this point? Thank you. So I guess there are two questions about uncertainty and about uh, the computational cost. 
Well, the uncertainty, I, I'm, I, I don't catch the, the, the question because, uh, well, we have random variables. We are, so we are trying to capture the uncertainty. We are working always under uncertainty. So I'm not sure what is the meaning of uncertainty here. Um, I don't know. And especially because we, we also have the Bayesian approach in, in, in learning and, and the parameters and also the structure of Bayesian networks. And the second question was about, uh, was about what? About the computational cost compared to traditional ah. time series models. Yeah, of course. Well, this is, uh, it depends on what you are uh, focusing on, uh, learning or, or inference or, or what. Because, of course, uh, inference is, uh, well, it depends on the structure as well. Because uh, if you have a bounded tree width, uh, which is, uh, yeah, has to do with the, the kind of uh, arcs that you are allowing, then uh, you are going to have tractable inference for learning. Uh, well, you have many heuristics uh, for for learning with a score or with a condition independent tests. So this is not so bad. But uh, for me, the good thing is that we have um, this uh, graph to visualize to interpret for interpretation purposes is very important nowadays. As you can uh, perhaps know, uh, there is a uh, a special focus on, on XI, XAI, so explainable artificial intelligence. So this means that we have to to be able to to, to give um, interpretations to our decisions to the mod, to the decisions made by the model. So in our case, we have a, a good point because we can perform any inference, we can perform counterfactual inferences, we can well. We can look at the data set, we can infer uh, independences. So we, we have plenty of, of, uh, of uh, possibilities for interpretation. With, uh, and also we, we see the relationship between the variables, even um, in this case of temporal data. So I think it's a, it's a very powerful uh, model. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so this uh, person, Carl, also thanks you. Is there any other question from the audience? Um, so I think we will um, leave it here. Uh, it has been, uh, as I said, uh, a, a great presentation. We, we thank you very much for uh, taking us through all these uh, very recent papers and recent uh, industrial applications. Thank you so much, Concha. And uh, to the audience, we'll hope that we see you uh, next week when we will have um, um, a young uh, online seminar series with three uh, uh, great speakers. Uh, see you next week. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Concha. So you, yeah, people are thanking you for your presentation. Thank you so much.